know, been doing a lot of work over the last two years on financial reform and a lot of work on national policy and public spending. So it's a huge, huge pleasure to be able to, uh, to introduce to uh, the one of the world's most distinguished economists. And it's also a great pleasure to be able to uh, be partnering with the CIBC, kind of back to your life. And uh, being no financial expert myself, I'm going to leave it to Hell Thomas from the uh, CIBC to introduce a bit of to you. I do love standing at this lectern. Fortunately, it's see through, so you can still see me. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you very much, Neil. And uh, we are delighted to be doing this event tonight with Policy Exchange. Uh, so my name is Helen Thomas, and I'm a director in the Fixed Income, Currencies and Commodities team at CIBC. Um, as I say, we're very pleased to be sponsoring the event tonight, and we're delighted to have such an eminent speaker with us. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes. For those of you who don't know, and I'll having talked to a few of you as you walked in um, about CIBC. Um, well, it stands for the Canadian Imperial Bank of Commerce. Um, we've been around for about 140 years. I guess that gives you a signal for what the Imperial part. Um, we are a leading North American financial institution with both a retail and wholesale bank, servicing over 11 million clients worldwide. Our head office is in Canada, and as, as Neil was saying, I'm sure you know the uh, Canadian banks managed to emerge relatively unscathed from the credit crunch, uh, which is uh, nice news for us. It means I can bandy around figures like tier one capital of 14%, and people kind of actually know what that means now. Um, but we are, of course, despite having our head office in Canada, we're a global organization. We have offices stretching around the world, Shanghai, Tokyo, to London and New York. Uh, and we're very keen to use this global perspective to offer macroeconomic insights to our clients um, both in Canada and across the world. Um, and that's why we've sponsored tonight's event, um, as we feel speakers such as Vincent can certainly offer us those kinds of macroeconomic insights. So, I'll give you a very brief introduction to Vincent. Currently resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. He has, and I hope you won't mind me saying this, about 30 years experience in, uh, in US monetary policy making. He served as economist at the Federal Reserve's Open Market Committee until 2007, and prior to that, he was Head of Monetary Affairs at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Um, he is, of course, also the author of After the Fall, which is, of course, the paper he'll be discussing tonight, um, which discusses the impact of adverse shocks on the economy and the appropriate policy response. And I'm sure, as we all know, the next US Federal Reserve meeting just around the corner, uh, Vincent can offer us a timely and valuable insight into the future path of monetary policy as well. Over to you, Vincent. Thank you. and said, Vincent, you don't understand, this weather's nice right now. <laughs> which is for three days the center of the universe among central banking. Uh, and I will do that, but first as an overall roadmap of what I'll, what I'll do to make it a little more relevant for you is I'll talk very briefly about the current conjuncture, just so you can see where after the fall fits in, talk about that paper and some extensions of that uh, based on comments we got uh, at Jackson Hole and also some of the asset market implications of that. Uh, but there are also implications for that, of that for the Federal Reserve, the Monetary Authority, and for fiscal authorities more generally in terms of debt dynamics. And then lastly, I'll talk very briefly about how, how all that fits together uh, in terms of the global implications, particularly uh, as the advanced economies of the world head along a different path than those of, uh, in emerging markets and developing economies. My goal is to talk about that very brief, briskly, spend about a half hour so that we can take questions. Uh, so that's the plan, and I start with the story thus far. And the story thus far is pretty simple and un, un, you know, easily understood by an audience of market participants like this. 
That is, June 2009 was the trough of the U.S. business cycle. We, we in the United States are in recovery. That's consistent with high frequency readings on the business cycle. It's also consistent with what the folks at the Nor uh, National Bureau of Economic uh, Research's dating committees uh, told us. And to some extent, that's not, not a surprise. The free fall in spending associated with the uh, considerable freezing of financial markets and the hit to confidence is, is past us. And market economies are basically resilient. They want to grow unless you beat them down. Uh, and we had considerable financial, fiscal, monetary, and, and financial impetus and some external st stimulus. That's consistent with the rebound in real activity. That will probably continue tomorrow with uh, real GDP. But the main lesson to take away from the last few years, it was a long time. Uh, this bar chart looks at the uh, nine post-war U.S. business cycle of U.S. recessions. And at 18 months, the recession of 2007 to 2009 was the longest. And that probably gives you a hint that in trying to understand what's happened to us over the last couple of years, that post-war recessions may not be the right comparator. You have to look a little further back to understand the full set of dynamics uh, uh, that's affecting advanced economies. You also have to look at the experience of other economies, including emer large emerging markets, to see uh, the consequences of severe macroeconomic dislocations. Not only that, it was felt widely. If you look at the 183 countries in the IMF's World Economic Outlook data set, just about a half of them had declines in output in 2009. And note, this is the most widely shared recession in the post-war experience. So by scale and scope, 2007, 8, and 9 were different. It isn't really the interesting question, are we in recover, uh, are we recovered as the recessions end? Because they do. The interesting question is how vigorous will the expansion be? Or to put it another way, what, where are the sources of above trend growth? And if you tick down the list, the components of spending, you might get discouraged. Could it be residential and non-residential construction? Household spending? Uh, increased financial accommodation or further monetary and fiscal impetus? Well, with regard to construction generally, it's very difficult to inflate a balloon that burst. Uh, and so that normal channel of monetary transmission, that is, and recovery, that is, monetary policy ease, it provides a lift to house prices, it provides a lift to construction spending, and which has a much higher amplitude than many of the other components of spending, is not likely uh, to provide a vigorous uh, uh, kick to spending. We will have the advantage that a negative goes away, and when a negative goes away, that's positive, but it's not a source of vigorous nor sustained expansion. Similarly, think about households. In the United States, what did households learn uh, by house price declines uh, from 2006 onwards? That equity in homes was not an ATM machine to support spending. If anything, households are going to want to rebuild spending. And if they're rebuilding, spend, uh, rebuild, rebuilding saving, and the only way you rebuild saving is to consume less than you earn. Increased financial accommodation? Well, the green bars give uh, net income of commercial banks. Again, this is from, again, over the post-war period. And what you see is they're living through the last two years that were record lows on their income statements as they tried to come to grips with the legacy of bad loans and a loan book that looks sour when, given where the unemployment rate is and weak loan demand. Monetary or fiscal uh, impetus? We'll talk a lot about that. We'll talk about that more, but the nor a normal engine of economic recovery, Federal Reserve ease, been there, done that. 
what we have to ask you, are there other forms of, of, of uh, monetary accommodation, specifically quantitative easing? And we'll talk about that. Oh, at that point, my discussion of quantitative easing it reflects only my views and not the views of my prior co-author on the subject. Who would be Chairman Renee. Uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal impetus? Well, the White House has the very unpleasant surprise that there's a voter constraint to increasing budget deficits in the United States. And the electoral cycle is such that this is unlikely to continue. So as a consequence, when you do that thought exercise, you probably conclude that U.S. spending is likely to grow at a subpar rate. But if spending grows at a subpar rate, then additions to the workforce will be at a subpar rate, meaning the unemployment rate will stay where it is in the neighborhood of 9.5%. That's a risk in and of itself, because a high unemployment rate tests all business models. Financial institutions will have more trouble with their legacy losses. They will find new losses on their own. It also tests the business, another business model, that of politicians. Politicians can't do nothing when the unemployment rate's nine and a half percent. And politicians push to do something, don't always do the right thing. Now, if we have high unemployment and subdued uh, pace of spending, then if anything, inflation will face some downward pressure. Most measures of cost and prices are, have been trending lower. Uh, the U.S. is in the midst of disinflation. And indeed, the biggest mystery is why hasn't inflation fallen more? Uh, the points here are the IMF's estimate of the output gap in the United States from 1980 and the, uh, along here and then the change in inflation along there. And if you look at the normal association between the change in inflation and the output gap, you would think we were in for considerable further declines in inflation. The IMF's forecast, like the forecast the Federal Reserve has thus far put out, we'll get more information uh, uh, when the minutes of the next meeting are, are published, involve an act of faith that households' inflation expectations will remain well anchored and the considerable resource slack won't pull inflation down further. That, of course, is a, uh, uh, an act of faith that's convenient because if, if, in fact, resource slack pulled inflation down further, then the nominal policy rate of zero would be associated with a higher and higher real interest rate. And so we would have potentially a, an unhelpful cycle of monetary policy tightening in an environment of already uh, considerable resource slack. There's also some international pressure on, on disinflation. These bars count the number of countries, again, in the IMF's WEO's forecast. Um, I have such a good life. I wait with, with, baited, with this, this heightened expectation for the WIO to come out. It comes out twice a year, and I get all this data. Um, is almost a quarter of the countries in the world had inflation at or below 1%. If you think about measurement problems with price indices, that means about a quarter of the countries in 2009 were in effective deflation. You don't want to join that club. Now, uh, an obvious question is, is this a surprise? The recession is an outlier in the post-war you know, uh, set of comparators, but maybe the issue is it's the wrong comparator. In the paper I talked about it, uh, for Jackson Hole called After the Fall, what we did is look at a bunch of macroeconomic indicators in the period surrounding severe macroeconomic dislocations. Now we did two things different than other people. First is we looked at the decade before and the decade after to see what were the longer term consequences of the severe macro, uh, macro dislocation. And second, we looked at a broader scope of uh, serious macro events. 
namely the Great Depression, 15 systemic financial crises in the 20th century and the oil shock in 73, 74. Why? We wanted big shocks that had different features to them. Financial crisis because it involves financial intermediation, the oil shock and, and the Great Depression because it was uh, uh, had a wide uh, footprint that is the scope was was was, was wide. You want to scale and scope. Uh, and then we ask the basic question: Do the macro variables the decade before the event look different than the macro variables in the decade after the event? That is, is there a long-lasting imprint of something bad that happens to it, to an economy? And the short summary is yes. Uh, what we looked at is, in the 10-year window following a crisis, GDP growth and real house prices are significantly lower for the decade, decade before compared to the decade after. The unemployment rate is systematically higher. Inflation, more ambiguous, it was lower after the great, in the Great Depression, it was higher after the oil shock, as we all remember, and tends to be lower in, 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 in systemic financial um, not only that, the events surrounding the severe dis the finan when there when the severe finan dislocations of financial crisis, there's a pronounced leverage cycle. In the decade before, there's a buildup in private sector leverage. In the decade after, there's a deleverage. So let's talk a little bit about those. Real GDP per capita growth in real GDP in the decade before and after. The blue bar, the blue line to the right is, is the distribution across all these countries, across all, uh, across the 10 years for each country uh, before the dislocating event. The, this one was just was a financial crisis. Uh, the red line is the events, is the distribution of real GDP growth in the decade after the financial crisis. And the message is, real GDP growth tends to be lower. More, more bad outcomes are associated, fewer good outcomes. Indeed, the median growth performance is one percentage point lower in the decade after. The average growth rate performance, given the difference in these tails, is one and a half percentage point lower. Look at the unemployment rate. You're going to have to take my word for this. But look at the 15. I'm sure you will. Uh, in the 15 severe financial crises, in 10 out of 15 of them, the unemployment rate never returns to the pre-crisis low in the entire decade after the crisis. And indeed, in the five out of 15 in which the unemployment rate does, at one point during the decade, <coughs> fall to the pre-crisis low, occurs in the Latin countries that have much more volatile macro outcomes. So unless it's a volatile economy to begin with, a severe macro dislocation is associated with lower a higher unemployment for a protracted period. Importantly, there's a leverage cycle. The blue bars give the buildup in leverage on leverage in the 15 years and 10 years before the 15 financial crises. On average, the increase in private credit to GDP is 38 percentage points. Credit to GDP increases by 38 percentage points in the decade before a systemic financial crisis. In the decade after a severe financial <coughs> crisis, the average deleveraging is 38 percentage points of real GDP. So what happens? In the decade before a crisis, economic performance is supported by leveraging of households and firms' balance sheets. In the decade after the crisis, economic activity is dragged down by the attempts to reverse that leverage. And if you're wondering why Germany is doing better than the, oh, I know, actually, this German's done this one. But, but you, you wonder why some Asian economies did better. Korea is the only country that didn't have that leverage, 
didn't have the, didn't have rather need a, a deleveraging because uh, they were actually uh, uh, getting back getting to standard uh, standard leverage. Moreover, if you look at at uh, this financial crisis, you know the, the subprime crisis among the advanced economies, the only country that didn't lever up was Germany. So they don't have to deal. With it. Now, what's actually interesting, which is not in the paper, is to split up those that decade-long experience into uh, tranches of time, and also look at some mac, uh, some um, a asset prices. Uh, in particular, what we do is look at uh, the, f the far five years in advance of the crisis. Uh, well, let's start here. T is the crisis date. Look at the year before, the year after, the three years before, the three years after, the five years far ahead, the five years far after. And what happens? What happens is when you have a crisis, you have an economic contraction. Real GDP declines 5.8%. You then, in the next year, have a sluggish recovery. And then you settle into a growth rate that is lower than the previous benchmark in the, before the crisis. You average a severe recession, a sluggish recovery, and, a sub, and an ultimately slightly slower uh, 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 long-run growth rate. You get the median one percentage point decline, the average one and a half. So the fact that we had a severe recession followed by a sluggish recovery and seemed to be headed for a subpar expansion is perfectly consistent with the experience of the 15 systemic financial crises in the 20th century. Um, the unemployment rate never, you know, when you average across all 15, tracks a higher, higher plateau than the decade before. Equity prices actually go down in advance of the crisis and keep going down in the crisis and come back sooner. House prices, however, keep going down. On average, house prices are still five years after the crisis lower than, than in the crisis. So in terms of asset markets, obviously, housing is a different kind of asset than equity. Now, why might it be the case that we have the you know, economic expansion uh, suffer after the fall? It is just possible that it, the financial crisis is a severe disruption of intermediation, leaves a legacy of, of bad assets, and it just takes a while to, to absorb. It could also be that low sluggish demand leads to unemployment. In unemployment, there's a degradation of human capital. There's a degradation of physical capital. And we just wind up on a higher, uh, uh, a higher, higher track for slack. Um, but it's also possible that the sluggishness itself, the bad economic performance, prompts politicians to produce bad economic policies over and over and over again. And then lastly, uh, we might in part be seeing the leverage cycle. The decade before the crisis wasn't normal. The decade before the crisis was made possible, facilitated by leverage buildup. The decade after is our a new normal. Uh, an, e an obvious question is, are we doomed to to, to recessions in, in, you know, after the fall? And the answer is that 7 out of 15 of the financial crises were followed by, by what you call two recessions in the decade after. We don't have the, the luxury of an NBR dating committee for the whole world. But there are two things that, that look like economic recessions uh, in 7 out of 15 of the, of the crises. However, if you look at it actually, you can always point to something else to, to explain the second recession. Uh, some exogenous, exogenous event like the Latin American debt crisis that, that pushed Spain, Spain under, or uh, you know the Asian <coughs> flu, or the Asian crisis uh, impairing Japanese banks. The basic message is 
when an economy grows more slowly, you're flying the plane slower and closer to the ground. You're less resilient to adverse shocks. It's not that you necessarily will fail, but if, so, if, if something bad happens, you might not be able to cope with it. Now, speaking of coping, let's now talk about Federal Reserve policy. And at one level, it's actually pretty easy uh, to work at the Federal Reserve right now. Why? Federal Reserve has a dual mandate, maximum employment and stable prices. The unemployment rate's 9.5%. Just about every measure of inflation they care about is <coughs> under 2 and 2% 2 and declining. In that environment, both objectives point toward having an accommodative policy. The issue is, should policy be easier than it is now? And one way to think about that is, how's the outlook changed? Well, this is uh, the Wall Street Journal's forecast of economic forecasters for a survey of economic forecasters for real GDP growth in 2010. It uh, in the spring and most recently, it's shifted inward in an adverse way. The outlook has deteriorated over the course of this year. And if you ask yourself if the federal funds rate had been four percent in June, what would have happened? They would have eased a couple times by now. The fact they haven't eased is something about the policy instrument, quantitative easing. And the irony, in fact, is quantitative easing is hard to quantify. <laughs> and its effectiveness probably varies with market conditions. But I'd like to think of it a lot like sterilized foreign exchange intervention. Markets are disorderly, times are stressful. What does that mean? What is a financial crisis? Financial crisis is an event in which the private sector doesn't bring much capital to bear on trade. And uncertainty is very high, and those with capital don't have strong convictions of where prices are, or should be. But if you're an authority and step in at that moment, your capital is large relative to what the private sector is able to commit. Moreover, arbitrage across markets are, are impeded, so it's unlikely that capital would flow from someplace else into the market you're in a reading of. Hence, stressful times, disorderly markets, a, a mere change in the central bank's balance sheet could have effects on prices. 2008, 2009, quantitative easing could have a big effect. Indeed, it was particularly in the market segments that were first intervening and in terms of mortgages and, and the like, they can have very big effects. 2010 is a different story. What happens if capital has returned to trading, arbitrage is linking markets more effectively and investors have more conviction and uncertainty is lower than what the central bank puts forward in their transactions is actually small relative to what the private sector has, and they're pushing against more convi stronger convictions. So the same people that en engineered quantitative easing in 2008 and 2009 probably thinks it, it works and are worried it doesn't work as, mo as well. Hence, some, un some unwillingness to act. And you're also seeing a committee at work the Federal Reserve is split among those who believe that QE really works. And, and it's a policy instrument just like the federal fund rate is. There are those who believe QE doesn't work or it sets a bad precedent. Or in the words of one bank president, is a pact with the devil. Um, the good news is we might have a senator from Delaware who dabbled in witchcraft, so. <laughs> um, so you know those most those two camps had to be minorities over the over the course of, of the, the second half of 2010 to wind up where we are. In which case, there's a set of swing voters. Swing voters didn't have much conviction about the effectiveness of quantitative easing. Didn't want to get involved in it. Didn't think it prob probably didn't think it would work. But at the end of the day. The incoming data has led them to mark down the outlook enough. Markets have priced in QE2, and so not to act looks like you're actually tightening. And they worry about the reputational risk seen of having an instrument that potentially could work, 
but not using it at a time of, time of economic distress. And so the end, in the end, that strengthened the resolve to act. This is every word in the last FOMC statement. Although the size of the words depend on how many times it's repeated. <laughs> there is one word in that word cloud that's never been used before in the history of FOMC statements since February 4th, 1994. Anybody know what it is? No, uh, no, we have unwelcome disinflation in 2000, 2004. And the answer is mandate. What they did with that statement is signal that the Fed balance sheet will get larger because they put in place a way of justifying it. They created the presumption in November that the Fed would act in November. Why? Because they said inflation is currently below mandate. Inflation is probably poised to potentially go lower. And that the balance sheet could be used for better economic outcomes. So if you said you're below where you want to be and the risks you'll go lower, and you have a tool to prevent that, you set the presumption that you'll act. And it really potentially sets a new, a, a new framework depending on how organized they are and how coherent their policy uh, announcement is, is, is in, in, in next week. They can talk about the mandate. Uh, November 2nd and 3rd is an outlook meeting, so they can update their outlook, compare the outlook to the mandate, talk about how their outlook has changed relative to the mandate, and use that to justify policy action. That's the case in the two the four meetings of a year in which they update the outlook are more important than the <coughs> uh, Assets of the Federal Reserve are going to get bigger. Uh, and quantitative easing, thanks to the beauty of double entry bookkeeping, could work on either side. The Fed buys stuff. They buy stuff and pay for it with reserves. The buying stuff can affect the price of stuff. And the increases in reserves can make banks more willing to lend. So quantitative easing could have traction in either parts. What stuff will they buy? That's easy. That'd be Treasury securities. Signal pretty strongly in the Jackson Hole speech that they, they were glad that the, the, the portfolio reinvestment program shifted the composition of the balance sheet more toward Treasuries. Um, they, they created a presumption to act, so they're kind of stuck on, on acting on, on November 3rd. How's harder? Uh, they could announce a big number, or they could announce a smaller number, but view it as a tranche that they could repeat depending on, on, on their characterization of the words. Or they could even link uh, repeating that amount based on how their outlook is relative to the mandate. That is, they could do shock and awe, a big number, announce one and a quarter trillion dollars. They could do constructive ambiguity saying, the, the FOMC is going to increase its balance sheet $500 billion over the next few meetings, a few meeting three, five to six months. Uh, and we'll monitor, carefully monitor and substantially the balance sheet afterwards. Uh, or, or third, they, they could make that trigger more explicit. That is, as long as its outlook produces outcomes that are, are uh, below its mandate, the committee will continue to, to, to purchase those assets. Uh, it's a question of how much uh, they want market participants to build in the expectation of quantitative easing. It's also a question of how much they, uh, how much uh, they can agree. What's the, it is, is, is it a coherent policy decision uh, produced by leadership, or is it a decision of a committee that's close, where the median voter is switching? Don't know. They got a problem. The problem is, over the course of the summer, the yield curve shifted down. There is a strong expectation of policy easing. Bill Dudley actually signaled pretty strongly when he said uh, that a 50 to 6, 75 basis point decline in Treasury in, in, in policy rates were consistent with $500 billion worth of, of Treasury purchases. Well, the shift down in the yield curve has got 50 to 65 basis points. So he's basically saying he thought that 500 billion was built in 
Uh, that means, among other things, that they might not get the event study results of the prior two years, because this isn't as, as much a surprise. Uh, and they're going to have to really work hard to either come up in the committee with a big number to outstrip market expectations or be convincing enough that they're willing to do more again in the future so as not uh, to, to actually have markets go the other way. I'm going to say briefly about debt dynamics, uh, about the fiscal arithmetic. You know, pretty obviously when you look at the IMF's last fiscal monitor, uh, we have a problem. The problem is countries running deficits also tend to have high gross debt levels. And that's bad arithmetic over time. You're adding more debt uh, when you already have a lot of debt. You might be reassured by the fact that emerging market economies have done better at controlling the, the, extent, the amount of gross debt they have outstanding. You might, however, be, take less solace from that because historically, the work, work uh, my wife did with uh, Ken Rogoff and Miguel Savastano, uh, emerging markets uh, have much lower, lower debt thresholds advanced economies. Uh, in fact, most defaults occur in emerging markets at levels that would satisfy the loss group for you. Uh, but anyway, uh, this, this should be, be, be worrying. And at that, I take, take the advice of Herb Stein, who worked at the AEI. If something is unsustainable, it stops. And think about the debt sustainability condition. On the top is the current level of the debt and the expected future uh, budget balances, that is the current level and how much debt you'll add, add, add. On the bottom is the real cost of borrowing and the real growth rate. Think about the numerator. The current and expected future budget balance is entirely about political willingness. That's for politicians to tilt up or down that path. And that depends on the, on the resilience of the political system and that political will. The current value of the debt depends on retainer prospects, things like restructuring and default. There's a wonderful regularity in, 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 in my wife's book with Ken, uh, this time is different, that they actually don't talk about but is in the data. And that is, there were very few defaults in the British Empire and the Commonwealth. And that's led political scientists, scientists to do studies of was it the language spoken, the place relative to the equator, the colonies were, uh, uh, you know, uh, Napoleonic code versus common law. Uh, but there's another regularity, and that is there were a lot of restructurings uh, in the em empire and the, and the commonwealth. That is, during this period, default is something the strong declare on the weak when they've lost patience. If you're in the same club, you're less likely to lose patience. They sometimes did. Newfoundland used to be an independent. Um, but uh, why am I bringing that up? When you think about the continent, continental Europe, a lot of what is going on is how willing are members to allow more troublesome members of that club to, to continue with unsustainable budget policies. Ultimately, they, it can't go on forever, but it might not be called a default. And from an investor's perspective, it's still expropriation of capital. Then, as for the denominator, I'll make just, I want to say 1% twice, and then we'll, we can end there. Um, 1%. Okay, after the fall, after severe macro dislocation, economies grow one, one percentage point on median slower for a decade. Well, the advanced economies with big debts are also tended to have severe systemic financial crises. So for a decade, they'll grow more slowly and that debt sustainability condition looks worse. Second 1%. And that is in a different paper uh, with Ken. Um, well, they found that if you looked at you know um, uh, that that experience for 70 countries over a couple hundred years, countries with gross debt in excess of 90 percent 
tend to grow about one percentage point slower than countries with lower debt loads. And indeed, it just sort of screams out at the data. This is the IMF fiscal monitor. This is gross debt, gross debt ratios, growth rates. Countries with bigger gross debts grow slower. Well, what does that mean? It means advanced economies that already have big debt levels, and if they had a systemic financial crisis, if they shared in the problems of 2007 and 2009, are growing more slowly because of that severe macro dislocation, which is pushing them into a debt range that is associated with even slower growth. So, if you think about that, let me stop. If you think about that that debt sustainable sustainability ratio, if you can't do anything about the growth rate in the bottom, what you can do is change the cost of borrowing. And that is you use mechanisms of financial repression. If you don't, if you if your debt is on an unsustainable path, it looks better if you can borrow at a lower rate. You rely on your captive savers. You do things like put on transactions tax. You do things like requiring prudential reserving in your financial institutions, where they should hold a very safe asset, government securities. You do things like have your central bank overvalue that collateral in temporary uh, open market operations. You do things like changing pension rules, so you have to provide fewer payments going forward. All that financial repression, the mechanisms to lower the effective cost of borrowing, so that what is otherwise an unsustainable condition looks more sustainable. And given the macroeconomic uh, imperative associated with starting from high growth debt, uh, debt levels and having a severe macro dislocation, those pressures are going to be pretty severe. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you believe that a price level target would make uh, quantitative easing more effective as a, an anti-liquidity um, trap um, policy, either through some combination of communicating more clearly what the exit strategy would be, or um, communicate uh, either in terms of the withdrawal of the QE, or what you would do in the recovery phase? Okay. So, should I stand here or sit here? Or was the <laughs> that way I can pace uh, a price level target is the triumph of modelers. Because what you find in an advanced economy is the interest sensitivity of spending is very, very low. So you need big changes in real interest rates to offset any adverse spending shock. Now, if you're already at the zero lower bound, the only way you can get a change in the real interest rate is if you change inflation expectations. But if you need a big change in inflation expectations to generate that big change in real rates to offset the spending shock, uh, then you would worry about your ability to reel that back in. Um, so if you think about it, Olivia Blanchard's advice from the fund of just six months ago to just have a higher inflation target rolled over and died. Why? Because most of the models they look at would require a very large increase in the inflation goal that would probably be associated with the adverse effects on growth that, that, that we saw in the 70s. So a price level target gives you an automatic mechanism of generating in inflation temporarily, uh, but a well-defined exit strategy because you have to get back on path. Historically, central banks have been reluctant to, to try that because they're worried that uh, the public would misunderstand the rapid inflation temporarily and, and as being some, basically having a real hard time uh, uh, 
uh, of parsing the temporary and the permanent component of inflation and inflation expectations might rise. Um, so I, I know for sure that when you run when you run run the worst races in the big in, in models, both small and large, price level targeting always wins because it fixes the problem of, of the low interest elasticity of spending and but keeps uh, inflation expectations well anchored. Will they do it on November 3rd? I find that very unlikely for a couple reasons. That's basically renegotiating your compact with Congress in terms of the legislation from one side alone. Uh, on the day after, leadership in the Congress, at least one house changed hands. So is it not being to mandate? So, yes, um, Merrill versus Dodd, a you know, Supreme Court decision, an independent agency is, is made independent precisely to make decisions about its instructions from Congress. And so, in principle, the FOC could announce that uh, to best further the requirements in the Federal Reserve Act, the Full Employment and Balance Growth Act portion of that, of maximum point of stable prices and moderate long term interest rates, it has decided that a price level target uh, is the most effective means. Therefore, it is fulfilling Congress's mandate with a technical description of how to do so. Uh, yes, I wrote that memo. Um, uh, but I wrote that memo 11 years ago. So, you know, um, uh, so there is a political problem. And the political problem is the very day Barney Frank, the chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, uh, was named chair, he gave an interview to the Financial Times and said, under no circumstances while this party is in power would the Federal Reserve have an inflation. If the day after Barney Frank is no longer in power. Uh, the Federal Reserve announced not only an inflation goal, but a price level goal. I think that would fray political cohesion. So I think there's a practical reason to do that. Uh, there, I think they are unreconciled about the way to interpret the mandate. One reason so many of them are talking right now is they don't agree about what their mandate is, so they're airing their differences out in public. Would a price level target work? Yes. I think they probably have enough stuff in place already in terms of their long run forecast, uh, a mandate consistent inflation rate, and talking about, about near term dip, uh, uh, missing of that uh, to accomplish most of what a price level target would get. seeks next bubble. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and from the Federal Reserve's perspective, I think the answer is the channels of monetary transmission are somewhat blocked. Uh, if it is a discretionary stabilizer, it's got to work through the channels that remain. Uh, there are primarily two encouraging, risky, risk-taking, to bring down private spreads and to depreciate the dollar. Uh, that has the consequence of um, encouraging capital inflows to small you know, emerging markets around the world. My, my wife and I wrote a paper two years ago called Cap about capital flow bonanzas and said that if you looked over a lot of countries over a long period, one of the best predictor of crises and sovereign defaults was whether they got a big slug of capital uh, a few years earlier and that 
that the patterns around that inflows of capital were pretty pronounced. The exchange rate appreciates the, uh, their asset prices go up a lot, growth increases a little bit, and then it gets reversed when the capital goes away. Um, uh, from the Fed's perspective, they would say uh, they have two problems. I was saying this earlier. If you were to draw up a list of the 15 things that could be done in Washington to uh, make sure the recovery was vigorous and we got to a better uh, uh, steady state expansion, quantitative easing by the Fed is number 14. Uh, numbers 1 through 14 are not currently feasible given political gridlock. What we have is an unhealthy focus on the Fed because it's the only moving part in the policy machinery. That's the first problem. The second problem is because of the blockages in, in, in the monetary transmission mechanism, the accommodation associated with increasing your balance sheet gets funneled through narrow avenues, and that could be associated with problems down the road. It's not, you know, they, there's a straightforward question whether you know the near term, the near term benefits are so obvious to to, to set those risks in motion. But if you're given a mandate from Congress, this is maximum employment and stable prices, and nobody else is doing anything. Mm -hmm. Um, hi, um, as we all know, I think the difficult thing about any statistic analysis is confuse the causation with, with correlation. In, in terms of, I can imagine of all the 15 financial crises you analyze, there will be different uh, reasons for the financial crisis to, to begin or to start, and there will be different policy re reactions after the financial crisis, and therefore the outcomes. It's helpful, it's very helpful to see the general trend of what happened to the unemployment rates and uh, GDP growth before and after. But you know, probably the median GDP growth before the crisis is not necessarily the same country as the median GDP growth after the crisis. So have you actually looked into the details of this of this kind of crisis and this is the policy reaction, therefore this is the outcome? Sure, and, and, and the answer is, in fact, there was a lot more homogeneity in the outcomes uh, across the 15 financial crisis than, than we thought going into it. Because basically, you're right, this is what we're seeing is an equilibrium process. It's also a political equilibrium. And countries that got bigger shocks tended to have more forceful policy responses and have uh, a medium-sized recession. Countries that had smaller shocks had less forceful policy responses and, and less changes in, in, in exchange rates, for instance, and wound up with just about the same outcome. So there was was less this um, uh, range of experience in some of the key macro outcomes than I would have thought going in. Uh, and, and part of the answer is um, is is the scope for policy make makers to do bad policies is, is, is pretty large around the world. And they do different things, but they all, but, but, the, but they all wind up <coughs> leaving about the same imprint. Uh, some, um, I think we, we very purposely uh, left it at here we are presenting macro outcomes and here are the couple here are some of the range of reasons it could out, it, it could eventuate. It could be just weak demand and, uh, and and the lack of policy response. It could be bad policy. It could be hysteresis that, that low, slow demand led to slow supply, or it, or it could be the leverage cycle. We sort of let them choose among among the possible explanations because it is it is a correlation. It's not causation. Uh, I would say that you look at the. Um, we're in the process of, uh, of, of working backwards uh, to see in um, from from the leverage cycle, like we did in the capital inflow bonanza paper. Uh, if you look at big buildups of, cre of credit, big buildups of leverage, do they always end in tears, or are there some policies that that actually produce uh, uh, better macroeconomic adjustments? But, uh, Take a couple of ones ago, like those gentlemen in the second row, and then um, just move that at the very back. 
Rob Dow of Industry Forum. <coughs> I understand the contribution of the finance sector, the GDP, may have been overstated in the run um, previous to the recent crisis. Do you agree with that? And if so, did you compensate for it? Yeah, I if we just take Ruby's question as well at the same time. I was wondering if you, compared to the median uh, growth deceleration post system uh, crisis, how Japan post bubble compared to that median number, and if there are any lessons that can be drawn from that? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that's the debate going on, going across in terms of Bank of England, the ECD, and the Federal Reserve. How much of the macro adjustments reflect? structural changes. I think you can look at the experience in Japan, for instance, to say the prior asset bubble inflated the value of financial transactions. And so when the bubble burst, there was both a level and growth rate effect. Uh, hence, that has huge consequences for your judgment of, of how much discretionary fiscal impetus there actually was in Japan. Uh, you have people who believe that, in, like Adam Poston, who who, who, who don't tilt down the path of potential output, say discretionary fiscal policy was never really used. It was all cyclical <coughs> because of such a big, big output gap. Um, I kind of think that, in fact, it was a level in, in growth rate effect. Uh, economies with even bigger service sectors, like the UK, presumably would have bigger effects. No, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't take uh, take take account of uh, of that. Uh, um, Take a count of that adjustment, but I, I, you know, I think there is interesting work to be done looking at the size of the financial sector um, uh, around macro dislocations. Just like there was interesting work to be done um, uh, in terms of the size of the financial sector uh, when inflation is high versus low. And in fact, the, the guy who has my job now, Bill English, did exactly that. What was the second question? It was, it was just. <laughs> It was about Japan. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, and I had such a good answer that I, I just, uh, I could pack some of it in, in, into that first part. And, 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 and I think that Japan recovery and subsequent expansion is, is a wonderful example that you can buy lower volatility with lower future growth. And so Japan didn't really have a recession. Japan growth path for, 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 for real GDP tilted down. And so you didn't have the macro dislocations associated with a big increase in the unemployment rate, a big opening up of the output gap. What you did is have the slow bleed in which the, the young generation in, uh, 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 of, of Jap you know, in Japan sees no real material prospects for gain uh, because that's what's happened over the past 15 years. Uh, I mean, it's a really, I can't help myself, I'm sorry. Uh, both in the Western, in the Western half, there were two lost decades, 1980s, uh, 1995 to 2005 in Japan. Uh, for the Latin American countries, uh, they grew about uh, a point and a quarter slower than the world for almost a decade. Japan's grew a point, and slower, a point and a quarter slower than the rest of the world for more than a decade. I think we're about to run out of time, but it's maybe time for just a question here, which is not simple, and I think that's a great thing. Slightly like more detailed question. Um, you can see the total degrees that done the event here, and the the so, I mean, they're kind of stuck. Once you've decided that asset class, uh, then the biggest bang you get for intervening in that asset class is to lengthen the maturity of the system of the market. That is, they presumably will focus on medium and longer term treasuries. Because because the shorter term stuff is already an almost perfect substitute for reserves. And so buying bills and short term notes uh, by swapping them for reserves that bear a little bit of, you know, so you're buying government securities that bear a little bit of interest and paying for them 
or your Federal Reserve obligations to pay a little bit of interest, that can't have any effect. Uh, so they're going to go at further out the yield curve uh, from you know medium term and outward. Uh, I, I think they're just sort of uh, uh, stuck in doing that. To me, I mean, execution risks are huge. Um, in the first tranche of quantitative easing over the period in which the Fed was bulking up its balance sheet, the held in custody uh, portfolios at the New York Fed, that is foreign, foreign holdings of, of government securities, increased by more, a Trump more than a trillion dollars. Uh, and so the issue is what, what will accompany Fed's purchases of, of Treasury securities? The worst case is foreign official entities view the Fed Reserve as flattening the demand curve for them to unload their holdings of Treasury securities or to swap out of their longer term holdings for shorter term holdings, <coughs> thus making their demands more volatile. Really, you've all asked a kind of great question, Vincent. I can see why you have your paper is such a star at uh, yeah, Jackson Law. Um, your message is maybe not particularly upbeat, and for your presentation, that's really, thank you so much.